for this session i am delighted and honored to welcome amongst us a padma vibhushan awardee dr chakravarti rangarajan a man who is best acquainted with the ups and downs of the indian economy professor rangarajan's work is highly valued by all professor rangarajan was the 19th governor of the reserve bank of india he was actively involved in the most important reforms to have taken place in the history of the indian economy the lpg reforms of 1991 during his tenure as the governor of rbi professor rangarajan along with his subordinates uncovered the harshad mehta scam one of the biggest financial scams of our country professor rangarajan has also chaired the prime minister's economic advisory council from 2005 to 2014 and was the member of the parliament in 2008 and 2009 a prolific writer he has authored many books highlighting major issues of the indian economy a person who is so closely related to academia and has taught many students in his life we, we all look forward to learning from sir in the course of this session we also have with us professor rajiv jha associate professor department of economics shri ram college of commerce a constant guidance for us the students sir has been a help throughout all our endeavors i now invite sir to welcome professor angaraj thank you very much and uh, very good morning to all of you and um, um, my hearty greetings to everyone um, i am indeed very happy to interact with you this morning even though uh, virtually um i want to speak to you uh, this morning uh, about the current indian economic uh, situation and then of course we end up with some observations regarding uh, what we should be doing not only to stabilize but also to move forward um the indian economy is facing today a, a severe crisis Uh, but this crisis is somewhat different from the various crises that we have seen earlier in recent memory uh, this is the first economic crisis uh, that has been triggered by a non economic factor a pandemic the various actions that have been taken uh, to prevent the spread of this virus and more particularly uh, the lockdown has resulted in the uh, entire economic activity coming to a grinding halt it is only with the relaxation of the controls that uh, the economy has started a uh, moving again uh, the assessment is that during 2020 21 uh, the indian economy might have contracted by 8% in the first half it contracted by 15.8% uh, the there was some positive growth in the third quarter and perhaps there will be some positive growth in the fourth quarter but the for the year as a whole the contraction will be 8% uh, as far as the current year is concerned that is 21 22 there are various estimates and perhaps that one estimate which the government stick to is about 10.5% even though the international monetary fund a few days earlier came up with a very highly optimistic 12.5% rate of growth for the, the economy now let us stick with the 10.5% but please remember the economy growing even at 10.5% in 21 uh, 22 essentially means that in the two years taken together uh, we have grown only about 2.5% one year there was a shrinkage of 8% in another year it was a positive growth of 10.5 so you have ended up with the two years of 2.5 which is roughly about 1.25% rate of growth per annum so this is really uh, two lost years in a, in a sense and therefore the question that arises is that what do we do in a situation uh, like this and there is also the fear of what is called the second wave of the covid 19 if the second wave of the covid 19 becomes too severe and we resort to lockdown one second perhaps uh, the uh, expectation of a strong positive growth in 2021 22 may also go or i mean and i think we may have to settle down with a lower rate of growth 
So let us hope that that will not happen. But anyway, in a situation like this, what are the policy instruments that are open uh, to the government uh, in order to be able to come out of the situation? The standard prescription, which uh, uh, people, uh, the analysts or the economists prescribe, is a Keynesian principle prescription that the government expenditures should be increased uh, during this period. Uh, this is uh, the, the case of a weakening of the effective demand. And when the effective demand is very weak, uh, the, the private participants in the economic system are not likely to contribute to the growth process. And therefore, it is the role of the government uh, that is important. And uh, it should come forward and uh, incur expenditures. It is on this basis in the depression of the 1930s, a large amount of what is called the public works program was undertaken in many countries, particularly in the United uh, States. So in fact, in, the, in that time, no distinction was made between one type of expenditure and another type of expenditure. Whatever expenditure that the government does, it was felt will stimulate uh, the, the economy. And that is why the, that expression, digging holes and filling them up again, became also popular at that time. That is what is required is let the government spend. And if it spends, then it will stimulate a demand uh, for the, the system. Given the COVID-19 background, what are the kinds of expenditures that are um, essential? First of all, there are expenditures to be incurred in order to combat the uh, spread of the virus and to take care of the people who suffer as a consequence of being hit by the, the, the virus. Therefore, there is need for expanding hospital facilities. There is need for uh, more ventilators and other equipment. So, and, and more recently, there is need for vaccination and incurring expenditures, uh, not only on research and finding out vaccines, but also distributing them almost free uh, to all the participants. So there are health related expenditures, which are almost mandatory. I think this is not something that the government can avoid. Uh, these is a must, uh, this is an imperative. Second, there are expenditures which need to be incurred by the government, which are in the nature of providing relief to people, to vulnerable groups who have been hit hard by the, um, by the virus. And uh, therefore the, the vulnerable groups and the most prominent among them is a migrant labor. There's been a lot of talk about it. And now only we realize the, the, the severity of the problem. The number of people who have actually migrated from states like Bihar or UP or elsewhere uh, to other states in, 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 in the country. And these people have been thrown out of employment all of a sudden. And they hear the host um, um, uh, either the, the states, the, the, gay, the, the guest states, or the states which are absorbing the labor, have to take care of them, provide them relief, and provide them also the, the, uh, the take care of their travel back to the, their own states. So all that is required. And I think it is here some, sometimes one feels that not enough has been done, and uh, the people have really uh, suffered and uh, some of the pictures that we have seen of the migrant labor moving from one place to the other place is really uh, hard to see. Okay, then of course there is a third one which is the stimulating the, the expenditures, stimulant expenditures. Now that is there are several industries like the hospitality industry and so on which have suffered extremely and therefore some uh, stimulant is required for, for these things. And there are many others as well. In fact, the, in the literature, there's a great deal of talk about which kind of government expenditures have greater multiplier effect. And the argument and the, and the conclusion is that government capital expenditures have, they have a greater multiplier effect than the, the revenue expenditures. Uh, the, and therefore it is good that the, in the, the budget, uh, the capital expenditures have been increased. 
uh, from 1.6% of the GDP in 2019-20 to 2.3% in 2020-21 and 2000 or 2.5% of the GDP in 21-22. Uh, so now the I think the, there is a need both from the point of view of uh, providing a stimulus to the economy and also laying the foundation for a faster rate of economic growth that greater amount of infrastructure expenditure is incurred. Now we can ask a question that how do we spend? Where from do we find the resources? That is therefore the need for revenue augmentation. Now obviously uh, the revenues had gone down very steeply in 2021. When income is not growing, the government is not going to collect more revenue. And therefore, on the one hand, the expenditures have increased. On the other hand, the revenues have come down. The consequence is, as you all know, the fiscal deficit goes up. I will come back to that particular point a little uh, later. Therefore, revenue augmentation is important. Uh, the revenue augmentation in 21, 22 um, can be good uh, because the nominal rate of growth in the economy uh, may be about 14% because uh, if it is 10.5% real rate of growth, uh, the uh, taking into account inflation, the nominal rate of growth of 14.4% assumed in the budget seems okay, seems all, seems all right. And therefore, there could be, I mean, I'm not going into the details, we have, don't have the time, uh, the, uh, the, the direct tax collection can be higher. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the assumed buoyancy is 1.6. In the case of indirect taxes, the assumed buoyancy is 0 0.8. Um, let me come only to one or two points on this revenue augmentation, which is uh, uh, critically important. Actually, the government really thinks that a lot more revenue can be raised through what they call disinvestment. Actually, the, the disinvestment investment program in 21-22 is extremely large. Uh, that is because they are thinking in terms of um, strategic sale uh, like uh, Air India and so on. But as we know that we have been talking about the sale of Air India for such a long time, I do not know whether it will fructify in 21-22. But uh, these are assumptions. And they also have what they call um, uh, a monetization plan which is essentially the sale of land, uh, the government land. Uh, one has to be extremely careful on this account because um, uh, the, uh, the procedure that is adopted has to be completely transparent and it should not give rise to uh, any accusation of uh, false uh, deeds. Now, very quickly, the two policies that are available to the government to deal with a situation like this is one is the fiscal policy and the other is a monetary policy. The stance of monetary policy so far has been, as far as uh, uh, the, the, the government is concerned, is to, as far as the Reserve Bank of India is concerned, has been twofold. One is to lower the rate of interest and the other is to improve the liquidity or enhance uh, the liquidity in the, in the, in the system. Uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the banks should be in a position to lend more and they should also be able to lend more at a lower rate of interest so that uh, the businesses and the enterprises will be enthused to borrow from the banking system. Uh, the policy rate, the repo rate as they call it, is come down to 4%, which is one of the lowest that we have seen. And uh, uh, the liquidity augmentation measures have introduced, have, uh, have included many, like cutting the CRR, introducing new schemes in order to provide liquidity, and so on and so forth. I would say, broadly speaking, the direction in which the monetary policy has gone is correct in terms of providing adequate liquidity and keeping the rate of interest low. But I think there are two cautionary notes which one, one will have to administer. One, while it is true that banks much should lend, they, they should also be careful in saying that, in seeing that the, uh, the lending is proper. Uh, the loans of today should not become NPAs of tomorrow. Uh, but this is not an argument against lending. 
but this is only a cautionary note. Second, the liquidity is increasing enormously. As you all know, in the recent period, the reserve money had expanded by about 14.2%, according to the latest statement. Uh, this can have an effect upon uh, inflation at some particular point, and therefore the central bank needs to keep uh, guard on that. In the context of these developments, one question that can arise is that what is the role of reform? You know, with the arrival of 2021, the program for the reform uh, program completes 30 years since it was launched in 1991. And certainly, the reforms introduced in 1991 constituted a, um, a, a major sh shift in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the system. It is a paradigm shift. Because what it really meant was that the, there will be a greater element of competition in the system, which will lead to improved e efficiency. And the improved efficiency will lead to economic growth. I would say there was three ways in which the economic reforms of 1991 marked the break with the past. One, it dismantled the large network of controls and permits that existed in the system. Second, it redefined the role of the state. Third, it integrated India with the rest of the world in terms of global trade uh, in goods and uh, services. We moved away from the uh, policy of import substitution. So in that way, it is an important break and therefore it is a paradigm shift. Today, we are at a particular point where there is no need for a paradigm shift. This, there, it is already there. We need to carry forward the reform agenda, the spirit of the liberalization program that was introduced. What we really need to do is we need to go into every sector of the economy and see whether the principle of liberalization, namely to introduce a greater element of competition and improving efficiency is satisfied or not. That is the most important uh, thing to, to do. I do think there are areas which, are, which, are, which come to one's attention uh, for in need of reform. One is the power sector. The other is the uh, financial uh, sector. And third, very importantly, the governance system, because people talk about ease of doing business, ease of doing how quickly and how efficiently the government delivers its activities. Therefore, governance reforms are equally important, and perhaps agricultural reforms are also needed. What I would say is that under the shadow of a big crisis in 1991, we could move some of the reforms very quickly. But now it is not possible. You cannot rush through it. We need a lot more discussion. We need a lot more a consensus, consensus building in the, in, the, in the system. And we need to pay attention to sequencing and timing of the reforms. I always felt that the labor reforms are best introduced when the economy is on the upswing. So that is what is required. In fact, in the context of the problems that are going on in relation to the agricultural marketing reforms, uh, my own uh, contention is that perhaps what is really required at this particular moment is simply to let each state to decide whether they want the reforms. It will be uh, a case of experimental economics. Um, uh, let each state um, do what it thinks is the be best, and then we will be able to really realize which kinds of reforms really work. Therefore, uh, at this particular point, uh, to avoid all controversies, it can be left into the to, to the to the states. Now, I mentioned about fiscal deficit. It is true that expenditures are important. They are required in order to stimulate uh, the economy. But stimulating the economy is one part of it. But in order to incur the expenditures, how will we find the, the revenue? Now, in the absence of the revenue, 
there is really a, there is really a problem that uh, that we face as we said in 2021 the expenditures increased but the revenues fell as a consequence of it you had a big gap or a big fiscal deficit which is about 9.5% of the gdp under the frbm act Fiscal Responsibility and the Budget Management Act, even though it has changed, implicitly it, it amounts to 3% of the GDP as a fiscal deficit for the center. Another 3% of GDP is for the states, according to the state legislations. In 2020-21, the overall fiscal deficit of the center and the states taken together is roughly going to be about 14% of GDP, as against a mandated level of 6% of GDP. Now, should we find fault with it? Perhaps not, because <coughs> the year that you have gone through is a very difficult year. And the, excuse me, And the need for expenditures is very much there, was very much there. And therefore, one cannot um, uh, find fault with having to incur ex expenditures in, in a year like, like that. Um, it is projected that the fiscal deficit will be 6.8% as far as the center is concerned in 21, 22. Now, sometimes that is Um, sometimes it is, um, I'm sorry, what is the question? Uh, no, I, I think the, the government expenditures to, during 2021 um, is really, uh, the, 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 it has to be, it has to be balanced a bit, but the point really is that perhaps, as I mentioned earlier, some type of expenditures like on uh, migrant labor and uh, perhaps um, taking care of the vulnerable groups could have been a little more. Uh, but the other expenditures have been in the right direction and of the magnitude. But it is there, I do feel that some more expenditures might have been incurred. But let me come back to this issue of the fiscal uh, deficit. The, uh, the, the, the fiscal deficit in 2021-22 is also going to be above the mandated level. Nevertheless, I, I think that in these difficult years, uh, the uh, fiscal deficit being above the, ma the, the mandated level uh, is, to be, um, uh, is to be recognized and is perhaps uh, uh, perhaps inevitable in, uh, in, a, in one sense of the term. Uh, but some people keep asking the question, do we really need to bother about um, the, uh, the, the fiscal deficit? Uh, you may have come across uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, observation by many people that there are many countries in the world where the, uh, the, the, the debt to GDP ratio is much higher than in India. Uh, going back to a period before COVID-19, uh, the center and the states taken together, uh, the GDP, the, the debt GDP ratio in India was about something like 72%. In Japan, the debt to GDP ratio is 238.0. That is, it's 2.3 times the, the GDP. So sometimes people ask the question, why is it that we are bothering about the fiscal deficit when a country like Japan is having a debt GDP ratio of that high? For example, I can give you another kind. In US, the debt GDP ratio is uh, almost equal to GDP, one, or, or 108. And in UK, it is 85.4 of the, G, the GDP. But what people do not understand is, 
ultimately, the problem is what? The problem is the interest payments. The interest payments to the revenue receipts of, of the government, if they become high, then it becomes very difficult to manage. In the center, last year, of course, it's an exceptional year, the revenue, the interest payments to revenue receipts came almost to 45%. That essentially means out of the total revenue that you are raising, nearly half of it is going only for interest payments. That is the real problem. In Japan and all that, it is low because the revenue receipts of those countries as a percentage of GDP is very high. In India, the revenue receipts as a percentage of GDP is 18%. In uh, Japan, it is 35%. And that is why in Japan, the, the interest payments to the revenue receipts is only 4.7 as against 25.8% in India. This 25.8 is for the center and the states uh, taken together. Now, all that I would like to say is that there is a reason why we have the fiscal rules. The FRBM Act was introduced essentially because that it is good to follow certain rules. And one of the rules is that to li limit the, um, uh, the fiscal uh, deficit. But there are exceptional years. I certainly agree that in a year like last year, or, or in, the, in the current year, 21-22, the need for incurring expenditures far beyond the revenue is recognized and it is important. And therefore, we must be willing to let the uh, fiscal deficit go up. But what we really need is a new roadmap for fiscal consolidation. A new roadmap which will tell us when and where we will, uh, when and at what point in time we will get back to the originally mandated level of 3% of the GDP. There is, in fact, an important rationale behind uh, the 3% um, of the GDP as uh, fiscal deficit of the center and 6% of the GDP for the center and states uh, taken together. I will not go into it there this morning, but that is important. Uh, there, there is a rationale uh, behind, it, uh, behind it. Now, I think it is important to say that what is the kind of economic model that we should really be looking at in, for, the, for, the, for the country? As you know, some time ago, people in this country have been talking about taking the economy to a level of what is called $5 trillion economy. At that time, that is two years ago, or two and a half, three years ago, India's total economy was equal to $2.7 trillion. Since then, it must have fallen because the income have not risen. But the point is, what requires to be done to move from $2.7 trillion to $5 trillion? Some calculations will show that in order to move from $2.7 trillion to $5 trillion, the economy needs to grow at 9% per annum in real terms, at least for five years consecutively. That is what is really required for the, for the economy. Please remember, India is now classified as a middle income country because of the per capita income level. Even after reaching the $5 trillion economy, let us say six years from now or seven years from now, India will still be classified as a middle income country. In order to become a really a developed country uh, with the, the required per capita income, the, we need to travel almost 20 years, two decades at the rate of 9% per annum. I am 
giving this simple arithmetic to show that we really need a faster rate of economic growth in this in the in this country it is only or to put it in other words economic growth is the answer to many of our socio economic problems in fact whether it is reduction in the poverty ratio or to give a certain minimum standard of living to the people it's only growth that that will do it and therefore we need to organize ourselves to move faster on the on, on economic growth but let me hasten to add that growth by itself will not give the benefit that i talked about in terms of reducing the the poverty we really need to supplement the higher growth policy with a policy to provide the appropriate social safety nets nets in addition to the faster rate of economic growth look back at our own performance of the indian economy between 2005 6 and 2007 8 during the three year period india's economic growth on an average exceeded 9% that showed the potential of the indian economy at that time uh, the gross fixed capital formation rate was about 38% and the incremental capital output ratio was 4 38 divided by 4 gave you 9 and a half that is a simple herod model herod omber model that we were able to raise our investment rate we were able to keep the productivity of the economy at a reasonable level and we were able to grow at 9 and a half percent in fact even if you add three more years to it the average rate of growth of the indian economy at that time was between 8 and 9% 8 and a half percent or something like that therefore that showed exactly the potential of the indian economy we have shown the capability to grow at the rate of 8 to 9% for five or six years continuously we need to get back to that we need to raise the investment rate we need to raise the productivity of the economy and then they said they, they if it follows that just high rate of growth of the economy alone is not sufficient because there are people who are poor there are people who are very vulnerable and we need to take care of that in some sense the higher rate of growth of the economy will percolate and will go down also it will provide employment for a greater number of people it will uh, give uh, a higher level of income even to the lower income groups but at the same time it is important that we do launch sufficient number of economic programs um, social safety net program that is possible because higher rate of growth will also mean larger amount of resources available to the center and to it i wish to the point out if you look back the larger number of economic programs in favor of the very favorable group, vulnerable groups just as the rural employment guarantee scheme or extended food security arrangement all of these were launched at a time of when the economy is growing fast it is possible to, to do it in my opinion what i say is that it is not enough to grow at a high rate of high at a at a high level we need to supplement the high rate of growth of the economy with a programs aimed at improving the lot of the vulnerable groups but growth enables you to to do that let me tell you one country which has essentially made the 
uh, elimination of poverty by just growing fast to South Korea. South Korea grew at the rate of 7% per annum or more for nearly two decades. And finally, it wiped out the poverty. And South Korea is today classified as a yeah, developed economy. And in 1950, please remember, South Korea and India were exactly in the same position. But what made the difference was a faster rate of growth of the economy, uh, which enabled it to do many things. But I would say that in the Indian context, uh, because of the fact that the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, there are a large number of people uh, who are below the poverty line, I would say that according to my methodology, that the, in 2011-12, we estimated it about 29% or 30%. According to the Tendulkar methodology, it was about 21%. I will uh, talk to you a little later if some of you have questions to ask. And then I will uh, supplement it uh, with some um, uh, numbers to show that how poverty actually fell at a faster rate or during a period in which the economic growth was strong. So I would say that as far as the current economic situation is concerned, uh, we need to handle it by increasing the level of government expenditure. And we need to stay far perhaps with a higher level of fiscal deficit in a difficult year like uh, 21, 22 and 2021. But we need to draw a map uh, for fiscal consolidation, and we really need to move in the direction of reducing the fiscal deficit and reaching the mandated level of 2%. But that is as far as the, as the immediate situation is concerned. But we really need to grow fast. And one of the important thing is that the investment rate in the country has fallen. It is in the final uh, analysis, it is the higher level of investment rate that will steer, that will spur economic growth. And therefore, what we really need is to give, uh, to raise the, 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 the investment rate, improve the investment climate, and, um, and improve the productivity of the economy. And as I said earlier, we need to supplement the, the strategy of faster economic growth with also a yeah, policy to provide adequate so safety nets, social safety nets, so that it is not simply growth uh, without taking care of the vulnerable groups. I think this is uh, the model of economic growth that we must really uh, work uh, towards. Um, I think I, will, I can stop here and take questions because you may be wanting to uh, ask some in the light of what I said or from um, uh, even outside what I mentioned. Okay. Thank you, sir, for this insightful discourse on the Indian economy and the way forward. With your permission, uh, can we take up a few questions yes, now? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. So, sir, the first question. Yeah. In an article in November 2020, you said a well-integrated investment program that focuses on capital expenditure to give the desired fiscal multiplier will be the answer to the economy's problem in a post-COVID world. Now, post the recent budget, what are your takeaways on the plan of action? So the point really is that is, is, uh, the, what I seem to have written at that time is exactly what I was elaborating also today, namely that uh, the fiscal multiplier is higher for capital expenditures. But I, when, when I talked about capital expenditures, I think I did not talk about capital expenditures only by the by the government. I think this is, that's both the private sector and the the, the, the government sector. The um, I said about the reform agenda, and one of the things that I said as a break with the past was the fact that uh, the there was a redefinition of the role of the state. That what I meant in that is that the uh, the uh, there is a definite role for the state in terms of providing infrastructure. And that infrastructure can be broken up into two parts, social infrastructure and physical infrastructure. Social infrastructure means health, education, and similar things. 
physical infrastructure is basically like roads, bridges, railways, and telecommunication, and so on. I think the role of the government in terms of the provision of infrastructure, both physical and social, is, uh, is important. As I mentioned earlier, that the simple um, uh, formula that one to look at growth is G is equal to S over V, where, where G is the growth rate, where yes is the investment rate or the savings rate, um, and V is the incremental capital output ratio. Incremental capital output ratio talks about the productivity of the economy, um, and uh, the investment rate is what, uh, what percentage of the total GDP that the society is willing to uh, invest. So what is really required is to create an investment climate in which the private sector will be in a position to be able to come forward and invest. And in that thing that the, when we talk of the investment climate or the investment environment, um, which will be required for, uh, 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 which will be required, uh, we are also talking in terms of the physical infrastructure that may be provided by the, the government, because uh, the, uh, the, the, the way that the private sector also looks to what is happening into the, in, uh, the infrastructure, because the infrastructure is a long-term investment um, and uh, therefore it, uh, it very often looks like that the government will have to uh, step in. So I was saying that if the government invest more in infrastructure, there, there are various models there. It is not as if the entire infrastructure needs to be filled by, uh, the, by the government. Uh, that is what we call the public-private participation. Uh, therefore, it can be a combination of the public and private, which will result in the uh, additional uh, investment in infrastructure. Uh, this has worked in, uh, uh, this has been experimented in laying the roads and so on and so forth. So the point is re-emphasizing what I said to, to this morning, namely that ultimately growth can come only out of investment and the investment will have to be made both by the private and the public sector, but the public sector is largely in infrastructure and the private investment will have to be made um, and an appropriate investment climate will have to be created for that particular purpose. So the next question is from Asa. Yeah. The privatization of uh, PSU banks has had a varied reception throughout the nation. Some have welcomed the idea of private management of banks while PSU bank employees are protesting against the move. What are your views? Will private management of banks help resolve the NPA issue? Well, it goes beyond the NPA issue. It's not simply the NPA issue alone. Um, the, the problem has to be looked at from a non-ideological angle. I mean, I think it is not a question of whether uh, the, the banking should be purely uh, a public sector operation or banking should be both a private and public sector operation. After all, today, um, from the time of 1992 when I was there, we allowed new private sector banks to, to come into operation. And that is why you have fairly large number of uh, private sector banks now uh, in uh, operation. There are foreign banks which open branches in India they are also private. There have been some private sector banks which have been in existence even before their nationalization. Since they were small banks, they were not nationalized and they are also there. Therefore, India today has a mix of both private sector banks and the, the, the public sector banks. The question really is that whether um, from the public sector point of view of uh, or from, the, uh, or, or from a public policy point of view of essentially creating an environment in which that the government uh, will have a predominant role in the provision of credit in the, in the credit system, whether it is re really required that, that it should have all the banks that it, it, it has. One can take a view that the government can play a very dominant role in the credit system, 
by not necessarily having all of the banks, but keeping majority of the banks under its, under its control. Now, today, I think I, I am not sure of the number, but roughly 70% of the um, banking system is under the control of the, um, in terms of the total credit availability and other things, uh, is with the public sector banks. It is only 30% or little less maybe with the private sector uh, banks. Therefore, the, 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 the question really is whether the government will be in a position to provide adequate capital to the public sector banks as they as the credit needs expand. Because previously, prior to 1991, uh, there was no capital adequacy issue. I mean, the question of capital adequacy all came only when the prudential norms were introduced post-1991. That is, if the credit system used to expand, uh, then the amount of capital to be brought in by the banks also has to expand according to the formula, the Basel norms or something like that. So the, the question really is that whether the, the, whether the government will have adequate capacity to capitalize the, all the banks as the credit system expands. Therefore, in some sense, and that is why I said non-ideological angle, from the sense of the, its ability to provide adequate capital, it may want to have not all the banks, maybe give up some of the, the banks. It's not a question of NPA. I mean, it's a question, after all, NPAs have been in the private sector banks also. It is not as if they, the NPAs, uh, the private sector banks have, uh, uh, have not had NPAs. But they also have, and they, in a, in a significant way, too. Therefore, that is not the issue. The issue is how much, what is the ability of the government to provide capital for a growing banking public sector banking system. If it finds it difficult to provide that adequate amount of capital, it is perhaps worthwhile to sell some of them and adequately capitalize the rest. So that is the way in which I will look at it. Thank you, sir. Yeah. We now have a question from Professor Rajiv Cha. Yeah. I invite Professor to ask the question. Oh, Professor, you are on mute. Are you on mute? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask two, yeah, yeah. two quick related questions. One about the fiscal deficit. Um, should we fetishize the fiscal deficit the way we have uh, to the extent that a lot of our public debt is not foreign debt? Our rate of interest is probably less than the rate of growth. That's one. Two, uh, when you spoke about South Korea, India's growth in the period 2004 to 11 has been more or less credit led. Our growth has not been led through exports. South Korea was a much, as an economy, was much more integrated with the rest of the world than India has been, particularly in terms of exports. So given that, do you think uh, a growth which is led by the home market would suffice to pull India out of the kind of straits that it finds itself in, or and that uh, it could have a significant impact on poverty and so on? Thank you. Okay. Um, the, um, the, the first question is really about um, the basis for a fiscal deficit and whether there is um, uh, a rationale behind um, uh, the, the fiscal deficit, uh, the, the formula that we have or the approach that we have to fiscal uh, deficit. You know, the, 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 the formula that uh, people normally talk about that if the uh, growth rate 
uh, is higher than or equal to the rate of interest on the debt. Uh, then uh, the debt um, um, GDP stabilizes. If G is equal to R, the rate stabilizes. And if the and if there is a stable um, uh, debt GDP ratio, then uh, there is no there is no problem. But um, it hides one fact, and that is that whether it assumes that the primary deficit is uh, zero. That is the there is no primary deficit. But if you look back to India's numbers, that we have had also a primary deficit. Therefore, G is equal to R, or G is greater than R, or, or will have to be, uh, the, the, the G will have to be greater than R if you have primary deficit. Uh, I have written an article, I think I will send it to you on, on this, because I, um, I, I, I the, the point really is that whether the um, the gap between G and R is sufficient to cover the, the primary deficit. If the primary deficit is high, then it doesn't. And we have had in the past, I think I, I, last year is not a good idea. Last year is a bad, a bad year to look at. But the primary deficit last year was 4% of the GDP. So it is, it, 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 we have had in the past a high level of uh, 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 deficit. Now I have in this article, again, traced how the G and R will behave in the, in the, in the future. Now, when our potential rate of growth of the economy was high, when we are doing 9% and so on, then the GR uh, difference was quite favorable because the G was fairly high. The 9% is a, is a very high rate of growth in the economy. And um, uh, because whether you look at it in real or nominal, it doesn't matter because you add it on both sides of the, uh, the, the equation. And, uh, and if R is low or R is reasonable, then uh, the D being greater than R is, uh, uh, gives you all the relief. But the point really is that our potential rate of growth in the economy is now down. I mean, I think the, the, the investment rate has come down to 31% now. Therefore, it is not giving you that. Therefore, in a sense, I, I am saying that this, um, um, uh, uh, this uh, proposition, that the relationship between G and R gives us some relief is not totally true. I mean, I think it, is, uh, it, it doesn't. And I personally think that the, I, I mentioned about the numbers that I talked about the interest payments to the um, uh, um, revenue receipts. Uh, I think those arguments essentially tell that we really need to be careful. And I, since you raise the question and I need to answer the question, I need to also say why I consider 3% of the GDP uh, uh, an appropriate one. Because I, the 3% the of the GDP plus 3% of the GDP for the states uh, means 6% of the GDP for the center and the states together as the fiscal deficit. Because in the final analysis, in the, in the economic system, there is only one surplus uh, sector, and that is the household sector. The government sector is deficit. The corporate sector is also deficit. And the third one, household sector, is the only one which is, uh, uh, which is, uh, which is a surplus sector. Now, the, the surplus is actually the household sector's savings in financial assets. The household sector saving in financial assets is only about 10 or 11%. And therefore, that is the only thing that is available for the deficit sectors. So if center and the states take away about 6%, then what is available to the private sector is only about 5%. And that 5% includes not only the, the, the pure private sector, but also the public sector enterprises, because the 6% is only to the uh, pure government. It's not to the public sector enterprises. 
Therefore, I have argued elsewhere that given the household sector savings and financial assets at about that level, the 6% of the GDP, uh, both for the center and the states, is, is appropriate. And uh, that, 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 that is the argument that I, that I have. Um, if you can let me know your uh, email ID, I will send you the article that I've written, and then you can come back to me and say that whether you agree with it or not. Now, let, I may, let me go to the second uh, question uh, that you have. Um, you know, it is, it is the, the two things, comparison with South Korea and India. Um, first, uh, you said that the, um, the, the high rate of growth of the Indian economy uh, is credit led. I, I have difficulty in uh, agreeing with that proposition. I say that actually the investment rate rose so fast. The investment rate, as I said, touched 38%. 38% is a very high level of investment rate. And the savings rate also went up as a consequence. And please remember, in that particular period, the fiscal deficit of the economy was also low. Therefore, it is, it is, it is a good, in fact, I had argued elsewhere, it is not only a high growth phase, but it is also satisfied almost all the stability conditions. That was a period during which I must say that the balance of payments was under a strong position. Actually, the export growth was very strong during that uh, particular uh, period. I would... So was the import growth. Huh? Huh? So was the import growth. Yeah, so will we, but the, but the current account deficit was lowest during that particular period. We never had that, that kind of a performance earlier. Therefore, I, yes, you see, South Korea had a different problem. South Korea being a small country, its rate of growth could be maintained only by the a strong external link. Its growth rate cannot be sustained by, uh, uh, by meeting the domestic demand alone. It has to meet only the external uh, uh, demand. So that situation is somewhat different. I, <clears throat> I still agree with you that external demand and <clears throat> an export, good export performance is still important even for India. But I <clears throat> believe that the, 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 <clears throat> the domestic situation is large enough for us to be able to steer our growth, uh, growth path. And uh, <clears throat> actually, the question that you have raised um, raises a further question. Why is it after 2011-12 we fell, actually? If we did so well between 2004, 5 and 2007, 8 or 2009, 10, what happened to the Indian economy after 2011, 12 to fall? I mean, actually, <clears throat> I would call 11, 12 to 21, 12 as a last decade because, in a, in a sense, that our growth rate really uh, came down to very low levels. I mean, it, was, uh, it is resembling the pre liberalization. But that, I think, will take another lecture. I mean, I think this is to talk about why India declined after 2011-12. But the point really is, I still think that if we had maintained the investment rate at the same level, and we, if we had created the appropriate investment climate, I think both economic and non-economic factors have played a role after 2011-12 for the decline in the, the rate of growth of the, the economy. But I still think that uh, 2004, 5, 2, 8, 9, or 9, 10, still a good thing. Thank you, sir, for answering our questions. It was an honor to host you. I believe I speak for everyone when I say that we got to learn a lot from today's session. On behalf of the Economic Society, Sri Ram College of Commerce, I extend to you my heartfelt gratitude for taking time out from your busy schedule to be with us today. 